Yeah, so uh, I'm going to just continue the discussion of skeletons because, um, I don't know. I think skeletons are important enough in game development that they're worth spending a decent amount of time on. So um, I'm fine with going a little bit further into the skeleton hole? I don't know. <laughs> There's a better way to phrase that, but in any case... Um, I was originally planning on talking about IK constraints, but I found that there's actually a lot more important, um, there are a lot more important features related to skeletons, such as uh, VR headset tracking, that I think are worth going over first. So, um, assignment eight has been put up. I, I, like I mentioned, Friday sessions will generally be for AR related topics, um, not this time because I couldn't lecture on Wednesday. And yeah, we'll just keep going into animation methods. So I'll talk a little bit more about skeletal animation, its pros and cons, and I'll demo a little bit better because last time the video was cut off and I was rushed. Uh, we won't get to this, but the next topic after this is going to be inverse and forward kinematics. So just as a recap, the general idea of skeletal animation is that you create some skeleton or armature or rig, and this represents your bones you make the bones be inside of the mesh for some reference pose, like a T-pose. You define weights, or you have the 3D modeling program like Blender automatically define the weights, which describe how much each bone pulls on each vertex. Uh, so for example, your shoulders are deformed by both your head and your shoulders. Uh, then you can define animations as just a transformation as bone uh, of bones. So. Sort of like how with blend shapes, you can describe each blend shape as a change in location of each vertex. You can describe anima or skeletal animations as a change in location or rotation of each bone. Uh, and you know, this, these are smaller details. Uh, generally, we think of skeletons as tree structures. So a bone has some head, which is what the bone will rotate around. So for example, your head, your actual head, um, will rotate around a head joint that's probably inside of your neck somewhere. And the tail would be like at the top of your head, for example. In game engines, we try to have a single root, which will us usually be somewhere near your abdomen. So in Mixamo, for example, we'll talk about Mixamo in a second, uses the hip. Uh, generally, there will be some kind of tree structure like this. So the hips will split into the upper part of the body. So it'll propagate up through the spine and then split into the neck, the arms, and uh, then there will be the bottom part, which is like from the hips down to each leg, and toes if you have toes. And uh, the hands will be the same, so when you go upwards, you can split into fingers if you so wish. Um, the, the way this actually works is the same as the way that the parenting system for game objects and actors works, so children will follow the parents, but not vice versa. So. If you move the hip bone, for example, it will move the entire skeleton. Um, I'll sh we'll see in a second. Well, I showed this last time, but I'll show another example. Uh, typically, we try to only describe skeletal animations as rotations, especially when we're dealing with humans or uh, living creatures in general. Uh, the reason for this is because if you think about how your bones actually work, your joint position doesn't change. So for example, your upper and lower leg they're joined at the knee, but they will never split into like a joint. Like the knee will never split such that they'll diverge at this point. So your upper and lower leg can't really get farther from each other at the joints, if that makes sense. It's a weird thing to think about, but uh, I have uh, my examples. Also, as we'll see, translating the bone can cause really horrible mesh distortions. And yeah, we try to describe it as only rotations. So. Uh, the reason that I specifically mentioned local delta rotations is because uh, your skeleton can be oriented throughout the game world in any number of ways, but if I want to move my arm forward, you know, I want to move it forward relative to my body, regardless of how my character is oriented in the game. So uh, we'll talk about bone limitations later. These are kinematic constraints. So demo time. Um, let me just recap the demos quickly. So. The very first animation method that we talked about was vertex animation, or uh, very simple uh, changes in transformation. So if I have a monkey in Blender, you can create this dope sheet window and the dope sheet will have your keyframes. So initially 
let's say that I want this to be its initial key, its initial location rotation scale, then I will move the monkey somewhere. Or let's say at frame, frame 30, I want it to be in this position and I want it to rotate like this and I want it to scale and at frame 30 it'll do that or at least this will be the end of this animation so it'll interpolate between these two frames. Um, I think what confused a lot of people actually in assignment 3 was the way that I was doing uh, the animation for your face. What I was doing was I was actually making the face of your previous frame really really small instead of deleting it so that you couldn't possibly see it while the next frame is happening. Um, so anyway, this is how you key things. It's just the I key in uh, Blender. Uh, then, for a skeleton, I'll create a very simple skeleton. If I have a cylinder like this, and I want to I want to remesh it so that it's, instead of having these long planar um, faces, I instead will have, uh, you know, they'll be subdivided a little bit more uh, uniformly. So remesh will do this. It will create rectangles, like, like smaller, more uniformly scaled rectangles as opposed to these giant ones. Um, it's just better for animation. I can create a bone. Um, you can hit the x-ray button. Blender 2.8's controls are all different, but there, there is going to be some x-ray thing somewhere that you can use to see the bone through the mesh. Let's say that... Um, what can I do? Let's say I also want to add a sphere. I'm going to give it a head. And I will subdivide it a few times. Alright, so... Let's say that I want this thing to be the head. Mm, I, I don't care. I, I have human examples, so I'm not going to put much thought into it. Okay, let's say that the pivot of the, the root will be at the bottom wherever this thing's feet are, if this is a creature. I can create a bone here. Um, I can create another bone that goes upwards like this. Let's say I... Let's say this is like a spine, and then somewhere up here is its neck, and then up here is its head. Um, this will be this thing's bone structure. By the way, I created bones with E. Um, I don't know if I still have the... I don't know where the, the Blender plugin that shows you key maps or, or what keys I'm pressing is. But in any case, you can use E to uh, extrude bones and create more of them. But that's not important. I'm just showing you a general example. So I create some bone structure like this. I fit it inside of the character. Then I can try to parent or I can make, I can try to make the mesh a child of the armature and Blender will give me some options like this. I'll tell Blender to automatically weight it. And what will happen is this. Now it's parented. See the cylinder is here. I have my bone structure here. And it's just a very simple waterfall of bones. And uh, if I move the skeleton, the child will follow. This is the entire skeleton. And if I go into pose mode, I can move each individual part. So if I want to move its head up and down, oh god, I can do this. And I can rotate it and things like that. Oh god, look at that. This is what happens when you don't have constraints. And yeah, I can move each individual bone as I wish. So if this is like its, um, like its abdomen, this maybe is its waist. And if I move the hip bone, it will rotate everything. So. This is just a very, very simple example. And if I try to translate the bones, well, actually, Blender's not even letting me do it because of my structure here, but um, I'll show you a different example. If I have this example with a person, 
Um, and we look at this thing, skeleton. Here I have some person that we that we bought from somewhere. Uh, and this is its shoulder joints. So if I rotate this, his arm will move up and down. If I translate it, um, this is what happens because the weighting, the way that the weighting works. So uh, this is why you don't translate bones. You can just rotate them to get natural human uh, motions. Also, when we talk about IK and bone degrees of freedom, it will also make more sense why you should only do it this way. Um, what other examples did I have? I haven't talked about Mixmo yet. This will be my only example for now. Um, if I wanted to, I could export this thing into Unreal or something. So if I export this as an FBX, remember that FBXs are the file formats that we use for animations. I'm going to call it, I don't know, I'll call it Matchstick because that's what it looks like. It's a Matchstick. Let's say that I bring this thing into Unreal. Matchstick. Um, there are some options for importing. Uh, Unity also has all of its own options. But most of the options tend to be pretty much the same. It asks you, like, do you want to bring in animations? Do you just want to bring in the skeleton and things like that? So, and also, do you want to recompute the skeleton in terms of the game engines, coordinates, and things like that? So anyway, um, in Unreal, uh, here is its end effector, which doesn't do anything because this is just like the top. It's not a head, it's just the tail of the last bone. Here is like my neck joint. Uh, here is my waist joint and so on. So yeah, FBXs are already compatible with game engines, so they're not very hard to get working. And you can do the same in Unity. Um, FBXs are compatible with most game engines. They tend to be the standard format for these things. Um, in fact, I think that most game engine can, engines can only support FBXs or OBJs and nothing else. Um, as an example, well, we saw, I showed you a Lincoln example last time of how Lincoln has his own bones. He has blend shapes, but he also has his own bones. So uh, here we have blend shapes for each of the phonemes, which we would use for face, an face animation or lip sync or something like that. Um, and the blend shapes work independently of the skeleton. So this part here is a skeleton. Uh, this is, see, it starts from the hips. So if I move the hips, it'll move this entire body. Um, and then I can move each individual bone. So like this. And uh, it will, you know, it'll break into the tree structure that I mentioned. So, you know, he has feet bones and things like that. I don't know if he has finger bones. I think most of, I should remember if Mixmo characters have finger bones. You can check out. Now he just has hand bones. So a hand here and he just has a hand bone. No fingers. But it's fine because the point of this is lip sync. Um, but yeah, that's just showing you an example of how you actually use these. You know, this, how, how you actually use skeletal animation in a game. Um, if I did want to animate something like my matchstick, I can still do it keyframe style. So if I open my dope sheet here, let's say I make some animation where initially this is its pose. So in pose mode, I can key each of these bones. Uh, generally, um, remember that we want to only use rotation for things that are like, well, we just, we, generally we only want to use rotation anyway. So I'm only going to bother keying rotation. Let's say 30 frames, uh, it will bow like this. So it bows. And then I want it to go back at 60 frames. So I can copy this set of keys. And I'll get an animation like this. I can export this to Unreal. I'll call it matchstick bow. And I will import it. Um, and Unreal has this nice feature where it, it, by default, will ask you if you want to use a different skeleton. So that's nice. Um, I don't have a reason to import the mesh, so I'm just going to import the animation. And uh, 
I think I ruined its scale, but if you, if I can get closer to it, you could see that it's bowing. See, so this is just an animation that I applied to the skeleton and I can still do a keyframe style. Um, it's just that this time, as opposed to like a blend shape, I don't need to deform the mesh myself and I don't need to save, save the actual deformation. I can just tell it that it has these weights and when I move a bone, this thing should happen. So that's how skeletal animation works. I can show you some examples of really, uh, really, really broken animations that we are working with now. Um, well, here we're doing sequences. This is for some other project, but here we're doing actual mocap sequences. We'll talk about mocap in a second. So this one actually doesn't look that bad. It's a little twitchy, but it doesn't look that bad. But we do have some that look absolutely awful. Um, yeah, something is wrong. I have way worse ones. I don't know what happened to them. Is this it? Oh god. Yeah, yeah, this one is pretty bad too. This is what happens when the weights are not right. The mesh starts deforming in horrible ways. Yeah, um, it looks like one of those creatures from Dead Space. You can also play with the Oh god. Where's the spine? Oh, there we go. I just want to do this. There we go. So you can <laughs> you can play with the offset while it's running and do some uh, absolutely awful things. You can also translate him while he's walking and you could see this deformation I was talking about. Um Yeah. It's pretty gross. But it's fun. Um All right, so back to the lecture. Um, I'll have more demos in a second. So some pros of skeletal animation. Uh, it's one of the least CPU intensive methods, which is one of the reasons why it's used by game engines so often. Um, it's been used since the 90s, or maybe, well, probably only the 90s, um, for just everything. I mean, pretty much any character was easily describable with a skeleton, so that's what people used. Um, also, bones are a natural way of thinking of a, of a lot of animations, especially any animation that is related to our body as opposed to our face. Skeletons can describe really, really complex motions. So, um, I don't know if you have like a dog or a tentacle or like any more complicated actor. Um, people describe things like earrings and physics with skeletons as well. Um, so skeletons can describe really complex motions, including human body motions. So uh, in movies, for example, you might describe, you can describe pretty much the entirety of a person's motion throughout the movie with just a skeleton if you wanted to, with just thousands of frames. Uh, as we'll see, skeletons are a really natural option for tracking systems, which usually only return a few points. We'll talk about this in a second. And most consumer trackers uh, fall under this category, so it's important for consumers. Uh, maybe not the movie making industry, but you know, even so. Uh, skeletons are widely supported, whereas other methods that we saw, like blend shapes and geometry caches, are not. Blend shapes only started becoming commonly used uh, within the last few years or so in, you know, in general game engines. Uh, since skeletons are described as trees, we can use optimizations that we would typically use for a tree. Um, so pretty much I mean, I mean, most of you should have taken 410 or algorithms or any class like that. So you'll know that trees give us really nice algorithms, uh, search, searching algorithms, uh, finding and things like that. Well, searching and finding are the same thing. Ignore me. Uh, as we'll see in a second, you can do some cool physics based things, which will not work with blend shapes like ragdolls. You can also share skeletons, which is not possible with other methods. I'll show you an example of this in a second that I use for my own work. Uh, you can describe animations with only skeletons. So in the example that I showed you before with the matchstick, 
I exported the bowing animation. I exported only its actual skeleton and its animation. I didn't have to re-export. I didn't have to re-import the mesh itself, which again will be really good for tracking or other uh, methods that we'll see. So to show you an example of sharing animations, uh, I have a ton of characters here. And I actually, eh, never mind. They're not actually sharing the same skeletons, but well, all of their skeletons have the same structure. I just didn't import them to use the same skeletal structure. So anyway, um, we'll see Mixmo in a second, but Mixmo characters all have the same skeleton. So um, you would actually be able to share animations between them if you wanted to. So uh, this is an example of one person and all these other characters will be able to share animations between each other. Um, this guy doesn't have textures, but it's fine. Um, let's see some other example. Like she also has the same skeleton. The structures are exactly the same. So they can share animations if I want them to. Uh, also you can, like uh, even though this animation is horribly messed up, I can apply multiple different animations to the same skeleton and if somebody else shared this skeleton with this guy, uh, they will be able to use the same animations. Not that uh, <laughs> you'd want to, but yeah. It's hard to describe the benefits of skeletal animation unless you, or uh, skeletal sharing unless you've actually had a reason to use it. Like in crowd simulation, I mean, we saw crowd simulation a few weeks ago. Um, in crowd simulation, you can have hundreds of different characters on the screen at the same time. If you can have them all share the same skeleton, then that just makes everybody's life a lot easier. Um, and you can apply, you know, if you have a randomized animation, you can apply that animation and randomize it and then apply it to all of the characters in the scene, even if they look different or have different meshes. Uh, but anyway, that's a very, very high level. Um, and it's something that I don't expect you to understand. Like, you can probably at a high level under appreciate the benefits, but it's hard to really, um, it's hard to really yeah, I, you, like I'm sure you understand the benefits as I'm telling you them, but you won't really appreciate them until you actually need them. Uh, that's what I'm trying to say, I think. Anyway, skeletal animation cons. Uh, if you ever do skeletal animation, you'll notice that rigging quality can be really inconsistent. So Maya, for example, tends to be a program that's better for human rigging. Uh, Blender has, its rigging features are fine, but I don't think that many people would say that Blender's system has better quality. Also, uh, there are some auto riggers which have really bad quality and some that have really good quality. Getting the weights can be really hard, especially for more complicated animations. Uh, there are auto riggers that will do this that we'll see. And also I showed you an example when I was working in Blender. Um, skeletons can't describe things that are, th they can't describe things that are not actually described by skeletons well. so face emotions for example are physiologically described by muscles and skeletons while they've traditionally been used to describe facial animations uh, nowadays we have moved on to blend shapes because they describe these kinds of motions a lot more naturally um, a lot of older games which uh, you know older games are not known for having good facial animations uh, they use skeletons and it's one of the reasons why characters in those games might not look that natural uh, it can be hard to describe rigid and non-rigid parts. Um, again, this is kind of hard to this hard to explain uh, without an example. I think I have an example here. I have this low poly character that I showed you. So this low poly character has a backpack kind of thing. He has a satchel, and I can't really you know it's low poly but he does have a satchel backpack kind of thing i can't really tell it's not very easy for me to tell the engine that the backpack itself should not deform much when he's doing an animation so um it's hard to tell because he is low poly but you know the backpack can do horrible deformations even though at a high level it shouldn't uh let's move on Oh, right on. Um, and finally, the parenting structure of skeletons 
you know, the tree structure is pretty strict, especially in game engines. Uh, and it's it can be hard to transfer skeletons between bodies because of this. And also it means that uh, generally you should only use skeletons to describe individually animated objects as opposed to like all of the objects moving in a single scene. So you wouldn't want to reconstruct an entire scene using a skeleton. That would be a bad idea. Anyway, some co a cool example of skeletal animation is ragdolling. So uh, ragdolling is when your character just sort of falls like this. So here the character is not ragdolling, but uh, they're, they are ragdolling. So they just fell over and physics are applied to their body. And it looks like, you know, I mean, it looks like they just fell over. It looks pretty natural, I think. Um, ragdolling is usually done with a combination of skeletal animation plus the physics engine. So, for example, you can treat each of the bones like the edges or control points of like a piece of cloth and add some collider to them so that, you know, they self collide, you know, the hands will collide with the chest, for example, um, and they'll collide with the floor. Uh, this is, you can think of it as like, it's a bunch of rigid bodies that are attached to each other, but how far they can actually get from each other is determined by the skeleton. So um, here, this is an example in Unreal. Make sure that things are going um, okay. An example, well, this is just another example, but you know, it's not very hard to do, and this guy did it with just a couple of lines of code. Uh, he hits G, I think, and it will let him ragdoll, and then he can hit it again, and it'll make his character rigid again. So that's one. A uh, cool application of skeletal animation. Another example of, uh, well, a more important use of skeletal animation is mocap, which is motion capture. I think most people have heard or or might know what mocap is at a high level, but you might not understand it that well. The idea is that you transfer some video of a person or some moving creature that's described by a skeleton probably, and you convert it into some animation that a game engine or some other 3D engine can read. So uh, the idea is that you would try to transfer body motions to skeletal animations and facial motions to blend shapes. Uh, although previously they would have been done with skeletons. And there are a couple of ways that we can do this, which I'll describe in the next few slides. Uh, but, well, this is uh, out of place, but you have, yeah, this is out of place, I'll, uh, I'll explain this later, but how you, the, the actual process of going from like these mocap balls, for example, which probably everybody has seen before, to a skeleton is pretty poorly documented. And generally the tracker APIs themselves will do it. Uh, a lot of the times you just have a solver that will try to fit some skeleton to all of these points that are on the person's body. But uh, again, this is kind of out of place. This has to be I'll talk about this later, but general idea of mocap. Um, if you have some mocap system, which is recording the person's body like so, uh, you would want the animation of this person doing whatever they're doing to be thrown into like Unreal or something. So um, in this case, you have some mocap program here, which is sending data to Unreal telling on real where this person is in the real world. So that's what mocap is. Um, this person is a real per tracked person, um, not just an animation that was handcrafted. So anyway, that was a bit rambly, sorry about that. So uh, one method of doing mocap is with active markers. So active markers can be blinking lights or infrared lights or anything like that, which, uh, you know, they, they have some mechanical component or, you know, they're actually doing something. They're not just static objects. So these lights, for example, are active markers. Uh, typically we use these markers for things that are not easily distinguishable. So, uh, for example, it might be hard to distinguish the VR headset here from the person's clothing. So it's a little bit easier to just mark it with one of these lights. Um, they also tend to be used with very complicated animation needs. So for example, uh, we'll see an example in a second, but if there are other light sources that would interfere. And a limitation of active markers is that they 
obviously they're lights, so they require some kind of power source. And as you can see, there are a lot of wires, and we'll see more in a second, but just a lot of little wires, and the wires themselves can limit your motion. But anyway, here's an example of how you can filter out only the lights. So uh, this is a convenient feature of these markers. You can kind of just segment everything else that's not lighting up. And an example from uh, Planet of the Apes is uh, they're trying to record this animation that's being done in broad daylight. And daylight can be, you know, it can be a really rough situation for trackers because the, the, the sunlight can interfere with equipment. Um, these really fast motions can be hard to track, especially if the camera frame rate is not high enough and so on. So uh, they use active markers for um, a lot of these animations. So, um, and obviously this is a pretty complex animation need because you're trying to map a human to some monkey that has physics and their body shape is different and so on. So you want the tracking to be pretty accurate. Another method is with passive markers, which is actually what VR devices use to get six degrees of freedom. In particular, they use passive markers to get your translation. And uh, we'll see an example of how they do rotation in a second. But uh, for passive markers, you would use something like retroreflective surfaces. For example, these balls, which will reflect any light that gets shot at them. Uh, so that's exactly what retroreflective means. Uh, a lot of the time, I mean, most of the time we just use infrared lights because infrared lights are not visible to the human eye. So you can avoid any kind of light pollution or interference. So an infrared light will shoot, a bunch of infrared, infrared lights will shoot at these balls and then the balls will reflect them and the tracking system will go to figure out where the ball is in 3D space. Uh, a nice feature of these is that luminosity is pretty easy to track in computer vision APIs like OpenCV. A common system that does this is called OptiTrack. It's used very commonly in the mocap industry. Uh, mocap is, I mean, OptiTrack is, it's a system that's basically this. You have mocap balls, which are attached all around the person. And you have these things here, which are, there's a little camera in the middle that detects IR sensors, or it is an IR sensor, I guess. And around the camera are IR lights, which are blasting at the mocap ball so that the camera in the middle can figure out where they are. Um, that's what OptiTrack is. It's a pretty common system. It's also crazy expensive. It's like many thousands of dollars for a year license. Uh, passive markers still require a decent amount of equipment, but you don't need wires on the person themselves, which is nice. And these are also really good for tracking arbitrary objects. So uh, VR headsets, for example, use these. And uh, a lot of the times when you're doing tracking of other things like these glasses and other AR displays, uh, people will start with passive markers before making a more user-friendly design. So here's the Oculus Rift. This is a Rift S, I believe. No, this is a, a, an original Oculus Rift. But anyway, this person has this IR camera and they turned the headset on and you can see that the IR signals are being sent or detected inside the headset because inside the headset there are these retroreflective markers i don't know what this dude is doing here here's another example um and sigref 2019 oppie track was showing this demo where they were tracking these people who have um they have really complex passive markers so they have these long strips of ref retroreflective tape they have mocap balls and so on I think the tape is retroflective. Anyway, they're reconstructing these really complex animations with all this retroflective material. Their little demo snippets are too short, but you can see the 3D pose that's returned here, and you can see it's actually pretty accurate. But again, they're using a ton of mocap balls, and they also have a ton of OptiTrack sensors around the top of this apparatus. so. Um, it's cool, but it's very uh, equipment heavy. And you can see that they can also, like this is, they're moving pretty quickly, yet the trackers can still detect them. So that's nice. 
And yeah, like I said, VR headsets use these for translation. Um, there's this cool, if you are interested in VR headset tracking, there's a pretty good paper that was published in 2014, which is when only the Oculus Rift development kit one, I think was out. Uh, the Oculus DK one could only do rotational tracking. Uh, but anyway, this paper explains how they do rotational tracking. Uh, the key points are VR tracking is not done with a single method. Uh, so you have a gyroscope, which will give you rough three degrees of freedom rotation. So this is a gyroscope. It's one of these sensors and, uh, you have some, uh, like metal plate and it gives you some information about, you know, like this, these three axes will spin and in, re in response to the weight of this thing in the middle and uh, it will give you information about how much these things are spinning. Um, to correct tilt, they do it with an accelerometer. Accelerometers return which way gravity faces so that you know which way is up and down. Um, the drift correction was done with some filters. The yaw correction was done with a, magnet a magnetometer, which is a compass. They explained how it's not exactly like a compass, um, but in any case, uh, oh yeah, sorry. Uh, this thing here is an accelerometer. It's just a little chip that contains some information. And uh, this thing here is a magnetometer, which has some magnet detecting thing at the end. Uh, the predictions, they, they predict future movements to try to make further corrections. So they predict like how fast can the person be moving and things like that. Um, we, I touched on this briefly last time, but there are these markerless methods which are done with feature matching and feature tracking plus computer vision. So uh, the methods themselves are pretty complicated, but uh, I, I can refer to you a bunch of papers and I also cited a bunch of them here and some videos. Uh, the benefit of markerless methods is that they don't really require much equipment. You can just use a single camera or a couple of cameras. Uh, markerless methods are also they excel at human faces, which have pretty well-defined features and they have symmetry or they have asymmetry, but there is some rough symmetry. And uh, we also have a ton of human face data sets. And nowadays we have GANs, which can also generate new faces. So um, markerless methods are great for faces. Uh, I'll show you some cool examples of reconstruction, but um, markerless methods get into reconstruction as a next topic. Um, I showed you this example last time from Disney Research where they were trying to reconstruct the person's face uh, markerlessly. So they try to track these patches and they try to figure out where each patch moves over each frame. And they use that to keep reconstructing the face and, you know, figure out which part of the image is which part of the face and so on. So they did a pretty good job. If you, you can see there in the reflections in this guy's eyes, um, the sensors that are being shot at his face. Uh, this is another thing that's often done with infrared sensors or sometimes just regular RGB cameras. But um, in a lot of, well, this is marker based. So if the, imagine if you have retroreflective markers all over your face, Um, but with marker with marker list methods, you're essentially trying to predict where these points are. So, for example, imagine imaginary points that are around this guy's face. That would be the markers, and that's what these algorithms try to figure out. Um, I forget the name of the paper, but there's this old paper that first described the structure that we should use for tracking human faces, and. Uh, it was a really good computer vision paper from, I think, the early 2000s. Um, I'll figure it out later. Uh, but here are some examples of how the face markers or features will move with different animations, but the structure itself stays the same. So this is how face tracking is done. This was done with AR Foundation, I think, which is some iOS library. Uh, oh yeah, this question. So. I mentioned that we, when we were doing mocap, we use skeletons for the body and blend shapes for the face. And the reason that we do that is skeletons will typically be animated. So for example, if you have a jump animation, you might create the jump animation in Blender, bake it into the FBX file, like with my matchstick example, 
and then blend between different animations in the game engine itself. But the problem is that body motions rarely depend on the face and vice versa. I mean, sometimes the face depends on the body motion. Like if you're following, you might make a scared face. Uh, but think of like your expression while you're walking and talking. It really doesn't depend on how you're walking. So we try to separate these. If the face animations are done with a skeleton, you can essentially fight with the actual baked animation and it's just not good all around. Uh, so um, this becomes more of a problem as the animations get longer and more complex. So at a high level, we want to decouple the face and the body. And for each of those, use the method that works best with each one individually. And physiologically, I mentioned that they're different. Uh, facial animations get controlled by muscles and your body gets controlled by bones. The only bone in your face that would control any of your animations is your mouth opening because you have a jawbone. Uh, and another thing is that remember that blend shapes are best at things that deform heavily. And if you think of how your body works, like pretty much any part of your body except the face, your skin doesn't really deform that much except at the joints. Like for example, if you bend your knee, uh, you might, you'll might you get wrinkles at the knee itself, but you, your upper leg and lower leg won't really deform that much. So in this way, blend shapes are kind of overkill. Uh, but as we'll see, you can actually create a, you can use a skeleton to create blend shapes. And I had some video that I made for software development, comp 523, where I showed my team how to do this. So in my example, what I was doing was, uh, I was, actually this might not be a good video to show. You can watch it yourself if you're interested, but to show you the Lincoln example, I showed you Lincoln last time, and Lincoln has a skeleton, but he also has facial animations. So um, I can do things like, maybe in Unity it would look better. Okay, so before in Unity, I was showing you that I can move his arms and legs and things like that. Um, his face shouldn't be dependent on this. So, you know, I would be able to do lip sync while the person is moving and things like that, which is especially useful in VR, for example, where you might be tracking the lips in a totally different way than you're tracking the body. Uh, so hopefully at a high level, that makes sense. Um, and this lip sync project is a good example of how this works and why you would do this. Like for example, the you might want to use blend shapes for the beard moving, but the beard won't be affected by anything else. Like it won't be affected by your shoulder joints. And so trying to describe the beard with a skeleton not only doesn't make sense at a high level, but it just makes your life harder. Uh, but anyway, that's super high level. Um, I'm going to present to you two great human making libraries. One of them is Mixamo, which is a product by Adobe. It has characters and animations. And the nice thing about this library is that all the characters share skeletons. So uh, you can use all of their characters and you can use all of their animations and they will all be able, like each character will be able to use each animation, which is a really nice feature. I'll show you an example. Uh, well, I'll just show you how it works in real time. Um, a nice feature that I'll show you is that you can upload your own mesh and they'll rig it for you. And you can also use it with all their animations and they actually have pretty good textures and materials. And in my experience, they work great with both Unity and Unreal. And for assignment 10, which is extra credit, uh, you're free to use Mixamo and I think it will work the best. So here's Mixamo. In Mixamo, you have characters and animations. So they have some of these predefined characters like uh, whatever this is. It's supposed to be a pirate, I guess. Space pirate. You have like this, you have Tom. Wait, Jerry is the mouse, right? Anyway, you have Jerry doing the Samba. Anyway, uh, you can choose a character and you have a bunch of animations that you can use for them. So uh, if I want, if he got kicked over and he's getting up, you know, he has this animation. 
dribbling a ball, you know, all these other things, having a seizure apparently. Dramatic irony. So uh, all these animations will work on other characters, so if I choose this dummy for example, you can do the same animations. So it's pretty convenient. I can also upload my own character and uh, ask them to rig it for me. So I had, there was this one, there was this character that we bought at some point, Sea Guy. And I just uploaded it and Mixamo will just rig it for me so that I can use all these animations with it. It's really convenient. Their solver is actually pretty good. See, the texture got messed up, but it's fine. So now I can use this character, which is, uh, you know, it's just this character from Blender that I was showing you before. It does already have a skeleton, but this skeleton would not work with Mixamo's animations because it's just not the same structure. Uh, anyway, I have my character in Mixamo and it can do all these things. And so if I were in Unity or Unreal, I could share this one skeleton with all of these characters and I can apply all these animations to that one skeleton. It's just a really convenient library to use if you want to have, you know, just a bunch of pre-made characters and animations. And I mean, there are a ton of them. I mean, we have 52 pages worth of animations. That's definitely not a small number. Uh, the other example was Make Human. And these will be the last two slides, I think. Yeah, okay, I had reconstruction examples after this, so I'll show those some other time because we, we didn't really get into reconstruction. But anyway, uh, the other example is Make Human, which is used to make custom characters that look a little bit more realistic and not as cartoony as Mixamos do. Um, it has a more advanced skeleton that also has facial bones, so it's great for making blunt shapes or doing lip sync or anything like that. You have some clothing options. Uh, my gripe with it is that it's not particularly easy to use. Um, it's not the most self-explanatory API, but to show you an example, it's also free and open source, but let me make some new project with make human. I made this uh, buff dude, this buff old dude. Wait for it's open. So you get some default character. The first thing I'm gonna do to it is add some clothes. I'll give it a hat. And I don't know, some clothes. There we go. I'll give it a couple of shoes. Whoops. Their default options aren't great, but they're good enough for some for most purposes, I think. Um. Anyway, you have some like macro things that you can change like um, you can there's a gender scale there's age so you can turn them into a baby if you want to or some really old dude you can make him really buff so uh, yeah you can make them even more meaty than they already are you can see that bad things are happening to the shirt you can make him I don't know you just you can absolutely, you can create absolutely horrible creatures in this program that will transfer to Unity. Um, yeah, let's see. Let's see, you can also do things like they have some pre-made skin colors. Tune apparently is a skin color. <laughs> let's use the default character. And uh, by default it doesn't have a skeleton, but it has some pre-made skeletons, so here you have some simple game engine skeleton, but uh, the nice thing is they have a skeletal, they have a facial skeleton, so you can use this for some things. And I don't think any of the mixed mode characters have facial skeletons, but they do have, um, they do have blend shapes. So that's a good thing about mixed mode, I guess. The characters do have blend shapes. So I don't know. Both libraries are good for different things, I guess. I'm Nick. just introducing you to them. Yeah. Blender has uh, facial rigging as well now. Oh, nice! Uh, it's a plugin you have to you have to add on, but it is it's called Rigify. 
yeah, it has facial. Rigify does generic animation, so doesn't it? Yeah, it, you can put a simple skeleton, like no facial, or you can use um, full. I think that's 2.8. Oh, above, yeah, so. I see. Okay. Oh, never mind. There you go. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, it's probably good. It would, pro it would be a pain, I think, to position all the facial bones. But anyway, last library that I want to show you is one that we use in research a lot called Simple. Um, it is pretty similar to Make Human, but it's a little bit easier to get working outside of its own API. So it has a Unity, Blender, and Maya plugin. The human rigging and weights are much more realistic than Make Human, and it handles different body shapes uh, because I believe that they used some deep learning framework to actually generate them. Um, it works. It has nicer blend shapes that you can use than Make Human does. Uh, it's a little bit hard to work uh, to get working, but it does have tons of parameters, so you can generate really complicated people that just look good. Um, and there are a bunch of like there are a lot of very body shapes. Um, and they generate the weights pretty accurately. So, you know, you can check out this video if you're interested, but we use this library a lot because it's a really good, um, like generic human body data set that you can use for a really complicated, like a, a recent trend is to try to automatically rig things. Um, and simple is pretty good at doing this. So you can use it to compare to, you can also use it yourself for your own purposes, but uh, yeah. You, you give it some mesh, you define a, a person's shape. So if they're, uh, you know, if they're skinnier or fatter, um, and you can describe what pose you want them to have initially, and then they will generate everything else, which is just, you know, it's a cool paper and we use it a lot. So I figured that I would at least introduce you to it because uh, some, some of the people in the class are really interested in the research applications. So, um, they had some training set that had hundreds of bodies, I think, maybe even more than hundreds. And they learned from this and they figure they use those to figure out the skinning weights and things like that. So you can check this out if you're interested. Um, there's this pretty funny uh, demo of just <laughs> tons of these people dancing around. But yeah, that is the end. You're free to log off. Bye.